Hello. Welcome to this episode of Incendiary. As you can see by that movie clip, we're here to talk about the movie, The Batman, from last year. With me today on the panel is Blue Samurai Zero. How are you doing, Blue? I'm doing okay. Sorry if I... Wait, hold on. There, that might be better. I'm doing okay. Uh, sorry if I was a little early there saying hello. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's fine. You didn't know about the clip. So yeah, folks, it's going to be Blue and I co-hosting this panel. Um, Jake and Bandito have some other things they have to deal with tonight, so we are going to hold down the fort. And uh, like I said, with us tonight, we are going to be talking to longtime industry pro Chris Wozniak. And uh, Chris, thanks for being here. Hey, Chris. Hey, Chris, Chris can you hear us okay? Yep, yeah, can you hear us? Hmm, maybe he can't. What we'll do, though, is... Oh, you're, you're muted, Chris. I think he's muted on his end, not in StreamYard. Yeah, I don't have him muted here. Um, oh, he's, he's talking to us, but we can't hear him. Hmm. Neff did this the other night, too, where he has his own mute on his own microphone. And oh. um, forgot that he... You know, because we can hear the like that kind of stuff. Uh -huh. So he, yeah, he forgot about while well, we're waiting for, for Chris to figure out where he's muted or picking the correct microphone in StreamYard. That's also an option. Um, but yeah, if Neff forgot that he was muted and suddenly went off on a, a book uh, we were giving a negative review to. <laughs> oh, I saw him do that rant. Yes. And then at the yes. end, we, we, you said something about, Hey, did you want to give that to us again? Chris, mm -hmm. could you check to see if maybe the microphone itself has the mute button pressed? I'm not sure if he can hear us either. No. Um, I know you can change your settings to change your speaker output too. But well, Let me see um, and make sure that he's not muted here. Uh, hmm. Nope. I, I don't show him muted on my end. Well, uh, let's see. What I'll do is, yeah, he's he's saying he can't hear us. You know, I'm hmm. going gonna, gonna to kick him and bring him back in. Okay. Let's see if that helped at all. No, we, we no. still can't hear him. Okay. If uh, I might need to hear. What can uh, you leave do? Leave the studio, then use the back button to rejoin. Oh, okay. Hope you can see that. I don't know if he's looking. I, I don't understand because we were talking with him right before we went live. So. Right. Yeah, this is uh, boomerang at its best here. Um, I'll reach out to him on, on Twitter as well. Let's see. Right. It was weird. Uh, in the back room, we could hear each other really well. Yeah. Things like this just happen. Oh, okay. He must have seen the Twitter uh, comment. He's going to go out and come back in. Maybe that'll take care of it. Sure. So one thing we can talk about is, you know, the, oh, and, and here he comes. All right. All let's right. see. Yeah, All there we go. Now we can there, hear you. <laughs> yes, no audio for some reason. I haven't, so I don't know what was going on. Everything looked that was weird. That was very odd. <laughs> okay. I guess I missed the intro. <laughs> <laughs> well, the intro is just uh, basically a musical intro. And then what we did was we played a real quick, like 20 second clip from the movie, The Batman. And that's, of course, one of the reasons that you're here is to talk about that and the contention you currently have with uh, DC Comics. So uh, if you could give us sort of a background. Well, first of all, let's start <laughs> off with this, Chris. Would you tell us about your background, your history in the industry? Well, I... Uh... Yeah, as it relates to Batman, uh, back in 1990, you know, I worked at DC Comics as a freelancer, uh, you know, writer, artist, um, and uh, it's that that's where I first uh, pitched this story. Um, <clears throat> so it was just, you know, it's just another Batman story. 
uh, and that I pitched to Archie Goodwin at the time. And uh, Archie really loved the story, he thought it was great, um, but he thought it was too big to allow me to do it because I was kind of like still a new guy, I guess, and you know, I didn't have a, a big reputation. And uh, you know, Archie was like, you know, it basically, uh, I don't know if he was speaking for them or if he had consulted with them already, uh, but he said that uh, Paul and Jeanette uh, probably just wouldn't let me do a story that important. Um, and uh, and so, you know, that, that's where it stood. I didn't push any harder for it or anything. Archie liked the story. I had a lot of respect for Archie. Um, I thought, you know, that that was good enough, you know, and that, uh, you know, that that's, uh, that opened the door, you know, enough that he knows I could write a story. Um, so, you know, I, you know, I let it go at that. And then years later, um, I ran into, you know, I, I pitched the story more than once over the years after Archie passed away. I, I repitched it, you know, um, so it was a story I just always had in my back pocket and I knew it was a really good story. Um, you know, cause I mean, like I said, Archie liked it. So, I mean, Archie is a, uh, you know, a giant in, in the, in the world of writing comics. And if he thinks it's good, you know, I, I, I knew it was good. And at, at the time that I wrote it, I thought it was, you know, I mean, I was young, but I thought, Oh, I, I just wrote one of the best Batman stories ever. I, you know, like, yeah, you, you, I, just, I was just, I was just hot for it. You know, and uh, I, well, you were you were you know understandably confident in your work. Otherwise, you wouldn't have pitched it. Yeah, I knew it was a good story. I mean, I knew that the split second I finished it, like I made copies for my friends that uh, um, you know were Batman fans. You know, I had a, a buddy that that was an assistant, and I had another friend that was a huge Batman fan. I, I made copies for them immediately, split second that I finished it, and I was like, "You got to read this," and so you know. It, it's just sat in my back pocket, you know, for a long time. Uh, as the years go on, you know, like, you know, anytime that somebody like, you know, brought up doing some kind of project or something, yeah, I'd pull it out. I'd go, well, you know, I got this great Batman story. We never did this. Do you want to go to DC with it? And, yeah. and, they, and they, you know, uh, you know, offered to quite a few guys like that, Tex and just for these things, you know, name brand artists that you would recognize. Um, so that story had been in circulation for quite some time. And uh, at at a uh, 2008 at the uh, New York Comic Con, um, I met Michael Uslan, who's the executive producer of the Batman films. And I didn't know who he was. He approached me at my booth uh, regarding another book that I was going to self-publish, and he liked the title of it. And you know, he you know, he asked for a comp copy. You know, he was like, you know, I like I like the you know, basically he said I like your comic book. Can I have a free copy? Mm -hmm. and, and you know but he, he mentioned that he was a producer he's always looking for good stories he gave me his card and at the time i didn't connect his name to the, the batman films or anything it was you know after the after the convention was over i went and checked uh you know i, I looked him up and saw that he was the batman producer i was like oh so i was yeah i got this great batman story that we never used you know we never got around to doing and, you know, so I sent it to him. I said, look, you know, this would make a fantastic Batman film. Mm -hmm. you know? And so he thought so, too, because he stole it. <laughs> and so, yeah, uh, because, you know. I, Allegedly. I, yeah, well, we're going to get into that part. Uh, but, you know, it, it's one of those things where, like, you know, in the course of uh, seeing the new movie, I didn't know that way back in 2008, right after I gave it to him, that uh, Warner Brothers was pushing a, you know, a Riddler serial killer story that had uh, Batwoman, uh, uh, Catwoman and Penguin subplot, you know. Now, does that sound familiar to you guys? You know? Vaguely now, yeah. Even though I haven't seen the film, I, right. I got the gist so, of it, yeah. Right, so four months after I gave, uh, you know, I, I, I pitched my story to Uslin, Uslin, you know, because Uslin has the Batman rights, he was pushing Christopher Nolan to do that Riddler story for his... Uh, for Nolan's third film, and Nolan just bounced it. He was like, well, he, he doesn't like the Riddler. That's what it comes down to. Uh, you know, and he wanted a physical villain for Batman to fight. He had just done the Joker, a cerebral villain. He wanted Batman to, to be more physical in the next one. So he, he went with Bane. He had no interest in doing the Riddler. So, <clears throat> but you know, obviously, you know, there there were articles and everything that I've only seen recently. That you know, with uh, was it David Goyer was a screenwriter? So that did I get that right? Uh, Nolan screenwriter for the Batman films, and you know, 
yeah, articles with him uh, mentioning that they were using that story to try to get DiCaprio and Johnny Depp to play the Riddler, and they were going after Rachel Weisz as Catwoman and Jonah Hill as a possible Penguin. And so, you know, the and 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 ultimately, you know, like I said, Christopher Nolan wouldn't do the film, even though you know Warner Brothers produces. And you should read that as useless because it's useless that has the Batman rights. He's the Warner Brothers producer that has the exclusive rights. And so, you know, here we are. This is the very next solo Batman film since then. Mm-hmm. And lo and behold, what do they roll out? This Riddler serial uh, killer story with you know, a Catwoman and uh, Penguin subplot. It's very obviously the exact same story, you know. Um, so, I mean, right there, that should tell anyone that, that you know, Matt Reeves did not write an original screenplay. Because if in, in 2008, if Usland's pushing a Riddler serial killer story with the uh, Catwoman and Penguin, and then the next, you know, he doesn't get to do it, and then the next time they do a solo Batman flick, it's, you know, what is what it sounds like the exact same story, then we know that, you know, what, what the story that we're all talking about is the same story that I pitched. They just added those, you know, the Catwoman and uh, Penguin subplots, you know, because that's what they do. They always add the extra characters from Mark merchandising and marketing. Oh, sure. You know, to, you know, so. So yeah. I wanted to ask you this. When you were uh, working for them as a freelancer and you wrote this story, I read in your write-up about this that they aren't denying that this is your story. So they instead, are they are suing you for writing an unauthorized Batman story. And that's kind of, that was the thing that really caught my attention. Yeah, So. It's- if if you were working for DC when you first pitched this, uh-huh. what was in what capacity? You said you were an author and an artist. What were you I, working on? Well, I you know I was a uh, mostly I was freelancing uh, art and and trying to get writing work, um, you know, getting out of penciling and into the writing side of things. Um, but you know, this notion that my story is unauthorized is excuse me. Um, you know, is can I speak freely? I mean, it's uh, well. That that's up to you between what you and your lawyers decided was okay. Well, I just, I'm just this this part everyone knows. I'm just saying that. I'm okay, gonna, then uh, yes, feel free. I, I, I tend to curse, but you know, it's just total bullshit because you know, in, in 1990, uh, you know, that door was open to everybody to pitch stories. It, we, you know, like it, it was just policy at DC that any, anybody could, you know, any freelancer could you know pitch a project a story a character anything they wanted anytime they wanted there yeah, was that's no- what i was going to ask you what would it take for someone to be <laughs> authorized mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> hey archie i got a good batman story you want to check it out okay and that their, their accusation their, yeah. their, their their accusation that you wrote unorthor unauthorized yeah. has no, to refer to activities done according to what standards when you wrote it not now right and of course uh you know we you know the the didn't actually in their lawsuit present any, you know, process for getting authorized because there isn't one, you know, there's no form to fill out. There's no, you know, it's, you know, it's one of those things There's a, Hey, I got a good story. You want to check it out? Yeah. Okay. And that's your authorization. That's all there was to it. You know, I mean, yeah, we're, we're talking about guys that we're all on a first name basis with, you know, uh, kicking around ideas all the time and, you know, going out to dinner and throwing around the idea. Yeah, it's ridiculous to sit there and say, that I had no permission to write a story. Um, you know, I'll write, first of all, I'll write any damn story I want. You know, but- <laughs> That's where I was coming from. Yeah. yeah. I had written, I had written a story that I pitched to Marvel uh, years ago and, yeah. you know, nobody came back to me and said, you're not allowed to do that. <laughs> yeah. No, I got news for you. No one at DC has ever done it either. This is the very first time they've ever, they've even rolled out this argument. DC has never sued any freelancer, um, uh, for submitting a story and trying to take retroactive control over it. I mean, this is the, the very first time it's ever happened. And, you know, and just to show, like, you know, how bizarre this, you know, because we all have heard a million times of, uh, you know, this this type of situation, because Hollywood does this quite a bit, you know, but usually their response is, well, we didn't see your story. We don't know anything about your story. We didn't read your story. Right. We certainly didn't use your story. And that's but- what you expect to hear. But yeah. in this case, I've got them so cold where I have a trail of, of when it was written, who it was you know submitted to, and also that it was used in the film. I've got them cold there that even the lawyers went, well, maybe we shouldn't argue that we never saw it. you know. 
So they came up with this nonsense of having DC Comics sue me to throw up a roadblock and try to protect their producer and, and Matt Reeves, you know, Muse Leonard Reeves, you know, mm -hmm. because I didn't sue DC Comics. I sued Warner Brothers. Well, right? Maybe you could, you could help people understand some of the process a little bit. So using a, an example that's not your own in just how things work in comics. First, you pitched this as a comic, not a, not a screenplay, correct? Initially, yeah, it was, I pitched it to be a, uh, I'm trying to remember if it's Elseworld. Um, I, I do believe it was. Um, mm -hmm. So that's basically like a standalone Batman universe type of thing. Yeah. So in and of itself, it has to be unique and original just, just to be you know considered for that. Um, because it's not really part of, of ordinary uh, Batman continuity. <clears throat> so... Um, and and yeah, I mean, I initially pitched it as a uh, um, you know a, a comic book. I you know I I, I you know it, it, when you're pitching something, you don't know where it's going to go. I you know in my mind, I presumed that they liked it so much that they would probably want to just kind of prestige uh, format thing with it or something, you know. Yeah, but sure. you know, ultimately, they didn't pick it up. Uh, so now, now it makes it makes sense that you're saying it would have been an else world. Some of the criticism, I now I've only seen criticism of your case. I think right after you filed the case <laughs> i haven't yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot less now you know, there, there was a lot of yeah i, I met I, you know i ran into all the haters and the you know the people that were arguing you know the fan uh arguments over the right the, and the people who are fan, fans of the case but disagree with you mm -hmm. not fans of you very different but anyway um they, uh, they're one could say well you pitched it as a comic that doesn't cover the movie could you address that idea no, I pitched it as a movie too. I pitched it. To, I, I literally sent it directly to Michael Uslan. Gave me his card. Said I'm always looking for good stories. So I mm -hmm. sent him a good story. I, I emailed it directly to him and said we never. You know, and I gave it a little fluff before I sent it to him. I, you know, I gave it a little once over uh, yeah. you know, to to try to make it a little more you know, you know movie movie fantastic as you know. Um, but you know, it, it, it's I sent I sent it directly to the producer. You know, so, I mean, this nonsense that, you know, first of all, it doesn't matter where I pitched it or what I did with it. If it the fact is I wrote it and, and, and that's the end of that. It's my story until you buy it from me. You know, you mm -hmm. don't get to, you know, uh, use it and then retroactively claim that you own it. You know, um, you know, it, it, in any situation, no matter what, uh, you know, what it may be at, at the end of the day, I didn't sign off on, on, I mean, you're, you're supposed to come to me and negotiate, you know, the terms for this, how you're going to use it, what's, you know, what's going to be involved, how much points are going to be, you know, when I'm going to get paid for it, you know, and so if I pitch you a story as a film and you go ahead and make a film out of it, you know, you can't then go and say, well, you know, you pitched it as a comic, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter, you know, right. where, where it comes from. There has to be a written contract in place. My Batman story is the only one in history that was used without a contract in place. That's for a comic book. That's for a TV cartoon. That's for a record, uh, you know, for anything. It's the one and only Batman story that has never, ever seen the light of day with a, a working contract between, you know, the, whoever's going to use it, in this case, Warner Brothers Studios, and the author. This is the only story. That's why their response is to retroactively go after ownership by saying, I didn't have a right to... Uh, write it in the first place, which is. Right. I did see another uh, playing devil's advocate again. I'm not saying that I uh, agree with this comment, so but I still want to put it out there to ask you to address it. And what I saw was somebody said, "So in the last 30 years, is it possible that this wasn't the only one written uh, like this?" So um, now well, you have you've addressed the fact that it was uh, an Elseworlds, so it's not part of canon, and it wasn't right. meant to be. And you right. also said that. It had to do with the Riddler being a serial killer, which is different than the Riddler is usually portrayed. So yeah, maybe very, I've already answered the question for you, but I'll, I'll shut up now and let you answer. Yeah, very, very different. Like my portrayal of the Riddler is obviously not the standard, you know, standard Riddler that was, you know, in use in, in back in 1990. He was not a serial killer for sure. He certainly was not a mass murderer. And, you know, and everything else that goes along with that character his motivations, his, his, his background and everything. That was all rewritten originally by me. That's not part of, of anything that had been, you know, um, uh, part of its history. So, you know, I mean, they, you know, the Riddler, although it still has to be the Riddler, 
and, and you know, uh, <laughs> his character. Uh, you know, it was, it was completely reinvented by myself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, it was just, I just, I, I knew I had a good story. I knew I was sitting on a good story. That's why, that's why I, I basically never even wrote more Batman stories. My, I had a, an assistant uh, from back in those days who did find the second Batman story that, that I wrote with him that we pitched to Archie that I had forgotten about. Uh, it was after um, that. <clears throat> but uh, you know, and, and even then, you know, just that, that that goes to show right there that obviously I had permission to pitch stories, you know, because if I pitched a story to Archie, Archie didn't come to me and go, you can't show me stories. I can't read them. Archie read it and I can prove he read it, you know. So mm -hmm. <laughs> but besides, I usually hear companies say that uh, for, you know, when just rando from the public like me would come up with a story and want to send it to him, they don't want to see it. You know, whereas you're already on the inside when you pitched right. this, you were already working there. So right. another another credit. So anyway, we know that stories jump medium all the time, and there's there are always rights involved. So th uh, that's the the simple. So sorry for throwing you some softballs, even though I'm I'm trying to work my way into how to how to bring out more. Um, some of the the criticism I've seen uh, also was at the I remember this was months ago. I haven't seen it, anything lately. Was that uh, Sure, they they saw the th the points that you and these are these are sorry these are audience members claiming they saw them they saw the the stuff that you claim was yours and that is in the film but there's other stuff in the film too therefore it's not it's not your story. Well, I think we're past that at this point because um, you know I mean the and we're you know because I'm not claiming any ownership to the Catwoman or Penguin uh, uh, subplots I didn't write those uh, oh, yeah. but I did. I did write the Riddler storyline that they use as the main storyline of the film. And mm -hmm. so that is a major contribution to an $800 million movie. And I deserve to get credit and compensation for that. You know, mm -hmm. and the other thing is that, you know, uh, that's all I asked for. I didn't ask for, you know, points on the film. I didn't get crazy with my loss. I just asked to be paid what the other writers got fairly paid. You know, mm -hmm. and if you contribute the main storyline to the movie, you owe me a paycheck. And, and a credit on that film, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we're, I'm certainly not going to go away until that's taken care of. Um, and and that's, that's all there is to it. I mean, there's just basic ethics involved and professionality. You know, if, if uh, you know, you know what, what are the ethics of uh, the, the producer that took the thing and scratched my name off it and gave it to somebody else to finish, you know. Yeah. You know, we, we, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not concerned about the ethics of submitting a story. If, you know, there are no ethics, you know, say I can submit anything I want. I wrote a story. Here it is. You know, here's a, uh, uh, you know, here's, here's, a, here's a story I wrote. Do you want to buy it? I didn't give it to anybody. You know, you have to, you know, and Usland's a, 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 a lawyer himself. He knows, you know, what, what, what he's doing. You know, let's say mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not, I'm, and initially I made excuses for him because I didn't realize that he was pitching that story, you know, four months after I gave it to him and he was using it to try to get, you know, DiCaprio to play the part and everything. I didn't know that stuff happened. Had I known about that, I would, you know, I would, I would have been even less kind of what I have to say about this. That's, that's, you know, what are the ethics of that? You know, this is a guy that runs around uh, in interviews. He's always uh, defending uh, Bob, uh, where I now think of Bob Fingerman, who's an old classmate of mine. Uh, <laughs> Bill Finger, uh, you know, he's, he's always defending Bill Finger and how we, you know Bill Finger was never, you know, got his proper credit for all, you know, his 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 contributions to Batman, and that's true. Um, but you know, but at the same time, behind the scenes, he's literally scratching the the name off his story and passing it off, you know, without ever even contacting me or or saying, you know, he didn't even reject the story. We just took it and ran. So, you know. One of the things you just said brought up another good question. And you said that had you known he was using it to pursue DiCaprio or Depp um, and maybe even Rachel Weiss to play Catwoman, what uh, what was it that brought that to your attention, that he was using it to try to I, entice I, those actors? Yeah, I got an anonymous uh, email from someone on Twitter, you know, just a, a direct message. And it was like, are you aware that, that you know, um, Warner Brothers was – you know, uh, pushing a Riddler story back in 2008. And I was like, I had no idea. What are you talking about? And he goes, yeah, there are articles and everything about it. And I went and looked them up. And sure enough, it's true. You know, uh, um, uh, they were trying to push it on Nolan. 
or, you know, all the articles are, or, you know, they all basically tell the same story. They, you mm -hmm. know, that, that Warner Brothers had a Riddler story that they were hot to do, and it was going to be the next Batman film. And, you know, that they were pushing Nolan very, very hard uh, to, to do it. I mean, I think Warner Brothers even announced that the Riddler was going to be the next movie. <clears throat> and um, so, that, you know, I, I had not seen these, I, you know, because I don't follow the, the, the <laughs> fandom side of things. I just, you know, I just watch the movies when they come out. You know, so if, if there's going to be a Superman movie, I know I'm going to watch it. So I don't look at the trailers or, um, you know, I like to just go on cold and watch the movie. I don't, I don't like the behind the scenes anything. I want to see the film, you know, and uh, I want to watch the story. And so I don't care for, um, you know, uh, teasers and, you know, a teaser is for something I don't know about. But if, we're, if it's a superhero film, I know I'm going to see it. I know I'm probably going to buy it, you know. And so, uh, you know, I don't care. I, I don't want it to be spoiled, you know, is basically it. But right. Speaking of Superman, and uh, just for people who might not understand how things really work in terms of a pitched story that maybe a company will accept or not accept, uh, there's this idea of a filing cabinet story. For example, just to, to not put the pressure on your case, uh, we'll take what Marv Wolfman's, uh, what eventually came out as Man and Superman, but was originally supposed to go in, this, in the uh, semi uh anthology series called uh, mm -hmm. Superman Confidential, and it was four issues. So can you talk about that process of stories coming in all the time and what it means to have a filing cabinet or a story goes in the drawer and what are the norms yeah. that surround that? Yeah, certainly I did a lot of that work. They, they, they're in, in the office, they're called inventory stories. And fundamentally, it's things you want to have on hand in case, you know, an artist or a writer has, has an emergency or shits to bed on the schedule or something. You know, it's, it's, it's basically there. Uh, so they can pull them out and they would fit into normal continuity if, uh, you know, there's some kind of disruption with your regular creative team. And so, you know, you know, you, know, you would write stories. I mean, I, I did those at Marvel and DC, um, writing and drawing. And, uh, um, you know, uh, Marv was, was an editor as well as, as a writer. So he knows more than anybody that, you know, what the process. So, you know, you know, that, that was just a common thing. You know, if you just like, you know, if you had a story, especially if you were a full-time writer, you would pick the stories weekly, probably, you know, I got, I got this idea, I got this idea, I got that idea, you know, um, and, and, you know, that, that, that's as formal as, as it was, you were, you know, you were allowed to walk into the office anytime you wanted, you know, the mm -hmm. office wasn't closed to freelancers in those days. You know, just no appointments necessary. Just show up, walk in, you know, go go door to door to the offices and talk to the editors and say, you know, show them some work that you did and looking to pick up gigs or create gigs or, you know, so if you walked in with a story um, and and brought it to an editor, that was as, as common as, as, you know, opening the mail. You know, that was just how things were done. Most now, I do people, know that, that Archie is gone, RIP. Right. That's Archie Goodwin we're talking about, right? Yes. Yes. So uh, with that in mind, though, do you have maybe like, not necessarily a character witness, but somebody who can come and support what you just described yeah, as absolutely. the, as the you know, modus operandi that was normal at that time? Oh, well, first of all, there, there are other editors and writers who worked at Marvel in those days that would confirm that, you know, it's okay to, you know, that, that we all had a free license to uh, submit stories. I mean, they, they, there are a bunch of people that will line up and say that. Okay, um, that, that's one of the things I was going to ask is if you've got some people who oh, are yeah, willing to sure. step forward and support you on that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, Great. Um, you know, because, I, 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 dovetailing yeah. with that, I was going to ask if, if some of the people you gave, I mean, you said you gave the, your script out to friends immediately as soon as yeah. you you had finished it. But do you, and, and I'm sure you shared it other places too, just on a friendly basis. Do you have people who are who have been, uh, you've been able to track down who are who are able to come forward and say, yeah, yeah, I, yeah the guy I wrote the second story with, um, he still has it. All right. <laughs> so, I mean, he's got the he's got it, and and you know, uh, he's also he thinks he's got uh, an original copy that, of of my uh, original 1990 copy of of the story that we're talking about too. 
you know, he's, he's, you know, he's got to go looking for it. If, you know, he's got a lot of stuff packed away and stuff, but, <clears throat> but he went looking for it and he, he's, he's almost positive he's got it. And he went looking for it and he actually found the second story, which I had completely forgotten about uh, that we wrote for Archie in 1992, I think. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, but I, you know, cause I, I just, my, you know, I was so, uh, anytime I thought about Batman, I always went back to that story that, you know, the Riddler story, because I thought that was like the home run story. <clears throat> so I forgot that I even wrote another story. I mean, and maybe I forgot because I wrote it with someone else and it didn't, maybe it didn't seem as personal to me, you know, um, that, that probably has a lot to do with it. Right. Uh, yeah. There's there's some people in in uh, the circles of independent comics out here that I listen to, and they're very much purists on character archetype things like that. And they're they're really annoyed with some of the the uh, main canon uh, that's been altered and pushed beyond the envelope as of late. But with what you're saying about your story it was supposed to be an Elseworlds in the first place, and you've got the Riddler behaving a little outside his normal range that makes sense you wrote in elseworlds these aren't going to be the same and lo and behold this film comes out and one of the big criticisms from the purists is they got the characters uh quote unquote wrong by going a little too far outside the envelope like with the riddler or or with batman well yeah it was in elseworlds so this yeah. is meshing up you know yeah and you know like i said i mean they, they we there are or first of all like um if you take my story, which, you know, I wrote it to be like an older Batman and they had some global aspects to it. Yeah. Now, now I don't know if that's what they were pushing it to Nolan, if they didn't alter it at all and they were just going to do that. Um, I don't know uh, when it got its little fluff to be a, uh, a, a younger Batman, but the story remains the same. It's beat for beat, the Riddler story, you know, all, all the aspects that are changed are all changed for one specific reason. And that's to, you know, take the global story I wrote and shrink it to make sure it fits inside of Gotham. So if I had, you know, if I had like the Riddler's, you know, ultimate revenge was to have like this biblical plague, you know, unleashed on the world, they did a like biblical flood unleashed on Gotham locally. And all mm. the changes are exactly that. They're all exact one-to-one -one changes so that it would fit inside of Gotham if it was a global element, you know. Scaling. Like, yeah. 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 So, and you know, yeah, because you know, younger Batman is, you know, is, is his whole entire career, his whole world is going to be Gotham. He's not yet an older globe trotting uh, superhero. Yeah, he's not in the Justice League at that point. Right. You know, so, so he's he's less experienced. So everything has to take place in Gotham, and that accounts for every single change in, to my story. They use my story almost soup to nuts. You know, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, besides that checklist where we could sit in front of a jury and go, look, this is the same, this is the same. You know, besides that, there are rewrites in it um, that, you know, could not possibly, uh, you know, you, you like, you know, when I show you how the, re the rewrites of uh, the, the character compositing, you know, is like, oh, we can't use Barbara Gordon, so we'll give Barbara Gordon scene to Alfred. And now the scene that we had for Alfred, we'll give to the mayor. You know, the coincidence is there. Or, or, or can't be explained as coincidence. Those, those are astronomical things to try to say that happened by accident. You know, they are so, you know, they are scene for scene. Uh, uh, we, you know, let's move this here and then we'll move this here because we're not using that. And, you know, that type of thing, you could write a million Batman stories and never ever, you know, have that match up with my story. So beat for beat. Yeah, yeah it's, it's just insane to sit there and say, it's not my story. And and they haven't. To, to date, there are lawsuits flying around. I'm suing them. They're suing me. But no one from DC, no one from Warner Brothers, not Michael Uslin, and not Matt Reeves has ever said, that's not my story. Not mm -hmm. one. So, so, and, so even to deny it, to say, call me a liar, that, not a word. They won't with that in mind, then, Chris, where do we stand with these cases? You've, you've mentioned there's two now. You're suing Warner Brothers, and DC Comics is suing you. Yeah. So, are you allowed to tell us where those stand? Uh, well, they're gonna, you know, the, you know what what the major film studios always do, and uh, is is you know push their money around. You know, they know they could outspend you to death. They oh, have yeah. unlimited funds, and you know anyone that's working in comics doesn't have the resources or the funds that to really sue. Uh, <laughs> I heard <a> that. <laughs> yeah. You got to find a legal team that will take it on, uh, you know, uh, you know, 
to, you know, to take the brunt of that financial uh, thing. And, and they, they would only do that if they smell a winning case. Obviously, you don't go after, you know, Warner Brothers, second right. biggest film studio in the world. So they know. stand to, they stand to uh, make yeah. financial gain if they help you win. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. So, I mean, you know, so, so, so there's that, but, but there, you know, the, usually what the film studios do is they try and kick it down the road as far as they can and try to, uh, you know, exhaust your, your funds. And mm -hmm. you know, uh, basically they just try to outspend you and, yeah. and, and cause a lot of, you know, uh, legal nonsense for you and try to run up your bills and get you to, to tap out. Oh yeah, yeah. we we're, we're used to this. Mark Wade did that to uh, uh, one of his detractors recently yeah. after after he committed tortious interference against the guy. So, yeah, yeah. So, and and a lot of the and this is in every case you get the, the whoever's got the the deeper pockets tries to so, you know, just pepper and nickel and dime the other side to death with wasting time on on paperwork that really wastes the judge's time, yeah. but because you have to respond to things now, if, if you're the defendant in the case or if, well, actually it doesn't matter which side you're on um, you, because you have to respond to things, you being you and your lawyer uh, for anyone listening, that's what ends up happening is you pay your lawyer to answer garbage arguments that never needed to be made that are wasting the judge's time and pissing him off. Well, while, while you or her, you know, judges could him or her. And, and you, you just run out of money to to be able to respond to to uh, yeah. the other that's, side. Yeah, that's, it, that's the game. Yeah. It's it's really yeah. disgusting. I mean, yeah, and and it's not going to apply in my case because we you know we're not actually spending my money, but um, you know, but they, they, but that's that's their strategy. You know, this just to outspend you, uh, and yeah, and it's ridiculous because you know, what does it cost to pay me? They're probably going to maybe wind up spending more on legal fees, but it's just you know. It, it's insane that, you know, that this type of thing even happens in this day and age in the information age, you know, why they would think that they can get away with this and they can get away with it. They do get away with it all the time. However, uh, you know, in my case, then I, I'm, I'm not going to be quiet about it. And you're, you're not, it, you know, if you do manage to win the, the lawsuit, you know, but whatever, you know, big deal. Uh, but, you know, what you're not going to do is you're not going to get out scot-free. You're not going to rob me and then, you know, it, tell me to like it. That's not going to happen. You can forget about that. I so, fear the implication this will have if, in fact, they win. Yeah. Because, it, you it, know, that it's going to be long reaching. And um, yeah. I, yeah, this I, is this is this is potentially a very groundbreaking case if this, you know, goes to trial. You know, and the thing is, like, I, I would love for it to go to trial. I would love to. I, I don't know if this goes in front of a judge or a jury or whatever. I don't even care. Uh, but if we if we get to sit in front of a room and argue our case, I'm, 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 I'm I'll do that in front of anybody. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'm, you know I, I, I'll take that all day. And I think that there would be a certain amount of notoriety and publicity around this, too, which I think really, although no publicity is bad publicity, I think this would reflect once again poorly on. Warner Brothers slash DC Comics. And they, you know, currently, in my opinion anyway, their fandom is uh, leaving in droves because of all the things they're doing to, to canon, the way they're treating their fans. And uh, this would just be, in my opinion, one more nail in their coffin. Um, yeah, I really don't expect Marvel and DC to go away, to be honest with you. But all they're searching for now is the ESG dollars. And because they are, they're just... Um, they're just walking all over the fans and they don't care. Yeah. And what, what I, what I think of when I, when I, I'm sorry, you're about to say something probably more important. No, I just, they, they, they just do, they are losing money hand over fist and you wonder why they continue. Yeah. You know? I think paying you would be um, okay. You know, you know how something happens and then everybody forgets and then they, everybody moves on and like it didn't happen. Okay. Paying you would probably be cheaper than what they're spending on lawyers. One. And then, you know, what they're eventually going to spend on lawyers, even though, um, but the, you know, so what's the hubris that, what, that they're bothering with, with this is I might, I, I know patent law and there are patent trolls, for example, uh, who pull all kinds of shady tricks. This isn't a troll. You have, you have the script in hand, you know, you put together your script next to the film. And I saw that, I saw you doing that on your YouTube videos. Okay. Got it. Um, Moving up, moving uh, to the next step is, well, why bother? They marketed this film as a Matt Reeves original. Yeah. Matt Reeves wrote it. For them to 
and even privately settle with you would still start the rumor mill that all of their PR was lying to the fans. They can't afford that PR. So they're just shooting themselves in the foot monetarily running around, you know, just, uh, it's like all they, all they know how to do is make everything worse. No matter, yeah. no matter what it's, oh. they can't just say, oops, you know, Hey, this was a mix up. This was really Chris's story. That's it came they through these do. channels. Yeah. That's a big mistake. We're going to take care of the guy who wrote it. That's all they need. That's all they had to do. They would have been heroes. And, you know, and I would have let them slide with that. You know, if they had said, look, you know, this is an oversight uh, and, you know, we, we want to make it right. And, you know, you know, I, I, I would, I would, I probably would have accepted that apology and, you know, and a payment. And, and, and I may have even been willing to maybe forego credit on the film that, you know, that's a big deal though. I mean, credit on the film is a massive deal. It's a very big movie. You know, obviously, you know, having a writing credit on a film like that uh, opens up tons of uh, career opportunities, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it, that's a big deal to, to but, you know, I, I may have been willing to do that, you know, going, OK, well, look, you know, I get it. And, you know, and now you, there are contracts out and, you know, <clears throat> you know, I understand the business side of things. I, I you know, I, 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 you know, and at that point, I, I was under the impression we were all still friends. Um, you know, I was certainly was not expecting DC Comics to sue me, um, and and you know and even with Michael Uslan, Michael Uslan used to work at DC. He comes out of that office, you know. He knows the people that work there. I've seen him at the office. You know, it's it's you know you you think nothing of it to give him a Batman story. You know, mm -hmm. he was not expecting this. You know, I mean, this, oh, it's, it's, yeah. Speaking of handing stories over again. Uh, back to that, that what you called inventory stories, just so people uh, understand the process. Is it typical for an inventory story to stay as a script and not be drawn rather than get drawn, or at least penciled and then thrown in the drawer? Which yeah, way is typical? It, de it depends. The, as the editors call, usually he will buy the story. Um, but even if it's an inventory story, it's put under contract. So as soon as the, you know, when the writer writes it and DC buys it, it's, it's put under contract right away. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, there's no, uh, and nothing's ambiguous as to who owns the story. And then, you know, uh, if the editor has got a hot team that's firing on all cylinders, he might just sit on the story. Um, but if he, but if somebody notifies him like, yo, you know, uh, I, I'm going, I want to go on vacation this summer. I'll be gone two months. You know, then he might have the story penciled and, you know, maybe just sit on it at that level. And then, you know, if it looks like they're going to actually use it, you know, get it inked and lettered or something. So, you know, he, he may have a number of stories at various stages of, of being finished. But, you know, you know, any any inventory story that is actually, uh, you know, been purchased is is now owned by DC Comics. It, you know, they 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 negotiated with the writer and whatever the deal was, and you know, they they own the story, so they can do what they want with it at that point. Mm -hmm. DC declined to buy my story, so they don't they don't own it, and certainly have no right to use it in any capacity, you know. Mm -hmm. So and, yeah, and and they're still using it. They, I just saw they're doing like a Riddler Year One or something with my reimagined uh, uh, origin and everything, you know. So they're still you know uh, plowing away with it, using it commercially. Show me the contract where where, where it says that I gave you that story. You know, there isn't one. You know. So I submit mm. to you, you declined to buy it, you don't own it. And now they're suing for ownership of it because it did get used and they know they have a problem. So yeah. That's doing the because, right thing, going, Oh, we screwed up, like you said. You know, well, you're, well you're especially if they're if they're taking your uh Elseworlds Riddler and building other books you know, putting out other books on them, the year yeah. year one or one bad day or something like that. And if, if they, and I don't know if, if it is the one bad day series, by the way, just for the audience, but yeah. if, if they are doing that, then yeah, that you're, you're looking at a lot more compensation and credit than just the film. Yeah. I yeah. mean, if they had purchased it, then, you know, if, you know, even if Uslan had bought it, then DC would have rights to it. You know, Warner's the parent company. They could, they could share all they mm -hmm. want but you know um but there's no contract for this story anywhere that's why you know there's no legal document that says they own it that's why okay. they, they, they're, 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 you know they're this you know hail mary pass basically to say that oh i didn't have permission to write this that's 
a lawyer came up with that. Yeah. Obviously, it's not anybody that worked at DC Comics. <laughs> with that now for for, for yeah. clarification purposes, let's go the other direction just to make sure right. people understand what what you say. Because I know what you mean when you say there's no contract. Um, but some people might hear that as saying you never got a contract. Let's let's go the other way. From the film studio, where's the contract? that shows where they got the story from. And that's something that would come out in discovery in a lawsuit. Yeah. So you're, you're saying that, you know, that from the film studio end, looking back in time, there's no contract to cover where that story came from. Is that correct? Yeah. Nor from DC. Um, okay. So, you know, the DC never bought the story and uh, Warner brothers never bought the story. So there's and if no they had, there'd be a con, they would have a copy of that contract. Right. Of course. So their defense, I would, I would have no case because they would have been paid and, you know, that yeah. be the issue. Yeah. And then or, or, would be free to finish my story and, and fluff it out as much anyway, you know, you saw fit, you know, and, and to use it to, you know, like, you know, if I, if I signed it over to them, they can then do what they want with it. And if they want to give it to Matt Reeves and, you know, and tell him, well, you can have credit for, I don't, I don't even know if I could stop them from, from, uh, you know, from not crediting me. I think, uh, you know, this and it depends on the contract. Sometimes people are, you know, when they sell the uh, something, they'll give up the right to any claim to it, um, right. even, even in the sense that they wrote it, and, and you know, that you know the company could conceivably just give it to Matt, and he could claim that he wrote it. But they, you know, they were, you know, when he's running around doing YouTube interviews, going how he came up with the, you know, this new unique uh, Riddler. I'm like, yeah. I got some paperwork for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's stuff like this then that is leading a lot of in or a lot of industry pros now to, you know, do their own thing, to get out from under this conglomerate of corporation uh, greed and unethical behavior. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to point out, uh, Chris, is that I saw on your Facebook page that you've got a story that you're um, considering uh, putting together called the the sun soaked adventures of Penelope powerhouse. Yeah. Now that, I saw that this has been out there for a while and you've, you've uh, pushed it uh, back a while back in August. You said that um, you had to put some stuff together because this is going to be a script now or a, a screenplay yeah. now too. Yeah. That, well, the, uh, I, with this property I made, uh, you know, I, I, I own the comic book company that you guys don't know about because uh you know, that had lots of Marvel and DC talent working for us. Um, but the investor, um, I, I got to be careful how I say this, uh, our money guy, uh, things didn't work out. Let's just say that. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, sure. So that I, works. I had a bunch of uh, properties left over uh, from that company, but I couldn't use the actual material, anything that we had generated. So I have to do uh, things new. So Penelope Powerhouse was one of uh, the characters that came out of that. Uh, myself and Chuck Dixon, we created a children's line of books for this company. And so Penelope Powerhouse is one of my, ch my children's characters. And, you know, when it was, I, I, when it got to the point where I was like, okay, I think I'm gonna self-publish a new comic. Um, I was just, you know, going through everything. I just thought that there was something there that was just very easy to get and, uh, uh, and pleasing you know i like the costume and i like the character name and i like the the the, the cheese element of it and uh it, it just seemed to be a winner and but i decided to turn it into uh you know like a i don't want to say adult humor because there's no sex in the book actually um but it's it's mature humor it's something like rick and morty you know that okay. type of thing. uh you know where there's some cursing in it and there's adult situations and you know, but it's also got a little some, some you know mixed with a little crude humor too, you know, like a South Park type thing. Uh, so you know, it's it's mature humor, and you know, I, I I thought that would be fun to do, and so I made the video, um, that teaser that I made, um, you know, back in the summer. Uh, as I was making that video, I didn't even know how to make a video. I'd never done one before, so I didn't. I you know, animation's not my thing sound is not my thing you know doing voiceovers i had to learn how to do that just to make that video so i was making it up as i went and then you know i made this little two minute teaser trailer and it you know it wasn't 
it, I had it sorted out, but it wasn't like ironed out, you know, it was just like, here's the idea, you know. And so as it happens, a, a Netflix producer, uh, you know, got hold of it and there was, you know, and he invited me to write a, a, a television pilot for it. Now, at this point, I had already started the comic book and I'd done like eight pages or 10 pages or something, but I was working off a plot that I had written. Now, you know, when somebody invites you to write a, a pilot, obviously you want to do a nice job and you want to be really on point and be focused and, and you know, because you want it to get picked up. First so, impressions, yep. Yeah, so I, so I, I kicked ass on the, on, the, uh, on, the, on the script, which I'm very proud of. And, uh, uh, but then Netflix had the, uh, you know, with the, you saw what happened with their sales, uh, the, the stock tanked and everything. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. that, so that cooled that whole thing off. Uh, right there for a while and so but now I've got you know this I, I wrote this great like you know pilot episode you know so I decided to restart the comic book using the pilot script instead of the plot that I was previously working from which is more comic booky this is more television animated type uh, thing um, so that you know so that was like the first delay and the other thing is you know right now I have uh, can't talk about this either uh, a writing, <laughs> a writing gig with another big streaming company, uh, uh, that is not uh, is not inked yet. So, um, so that's taking up some of my time. Uh, so, you know, it's it's one of those things where, I, yeah, I, yeah, I like I, it's it's a good property. I know I got you know a, a winner on my hands with this one. So, uh, you know, I just need to find the time to finish it. <laughs> When, when you get around to it, though, we'd really like to have you back on to talk about it specifically. If you've got a live campaign, make sure you reach out to us. We'll have yep. you on and, you. Uh, you know, we'll hopefully get some uh, backers eyes on it for you. That'd be great. appreciate that. Yeah. So, hey, well, um, thanks for being thanks for being here. Clear, clearing some things up. I know I hear people argue over court cases or, or just people pontificating all the time. And, and no offense to Artie Bear. Uh, hey, Andrew Jacks. <laughs> uh, um and then I don't know what that is, but anyway, uh, let's see. Where was, oh, I lost my train of thought. Here we go. Try again. Um, I hear people pontificating and whatnot, and they might say, oh, you know, nobody would ever do that. And it's, well, you know, nobody would ever do that depends on, or that's not how things work. Well, depends that, on what's in the contract yeah. that, that, you know, so it's the terms of the contract that always matter. I, I, I know I haven't been able to ask really good uh, devil's advocate questions of you, but I hope you've been able to clarify some things for yeah, and, and you know when, out there. And, and when this whole thing became our, you know, the big kerfluffle that it was, you know, on Twitter and everything, um, I I was open to all interviews. I, I I literally said anybody wants to do an interview, I will show up. I will talk about it. I will answer any question. I won't duck any question. I'll give you a straight answer on everything. And I did that on quite a few interviews. Um, and and. And I openly offered uh, uh, to debate Uslan and or Reeves at any point because I know they, I have them crushed. I know they'll never, ever show up. They'll never talk about this because they know what they did, you know, and and and, you know, it's very possible that Reeves was was unaware of where the story came from when it was given to him. Uh, and now he's got his foot in his mouth. And, you know, so but but it's it's, it's conceivable he's innocent in this. That you know, they gave him this, you know, uh, my story, and said, "Look, you know, you could fluff this one out. This one's great. You know, but, you know, make it yours." Yeah. You know, so that that's very very possible. So I, I'm not necessarily holding Matt Reeves uh, uh, so accountable because I don't know the details of that. But you know, when it comes to Uslin, I think we know what happened here. Um, you know. So, uh, so outside of Uslin, and I may not say his name correctly, but Uslin, uh, there's no personal animus going on with Mr. Reeves. No, I mean I like the movie. A lot of people were, you know, were, you know, they were all calling me a hater and a, uh, you know, Snyder verse. It's like I don't, I don't have a dog in that fight. I, I, I saw the movie. I liked the movie. After not the first time I saw it, I was fucking screaming at the television. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I had to watch it a few times to make the video, and I was like, you know, I get where it's going, and you know, I, I, I enjoyed it. I, I think it's a pretty good movie. Um, it's not, I get where, what he was going for. I, 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 I wasn't hateful about the movie mm-hmm. at all, you know, and I don't have issues with Reeves. I've got Matt Reeves, uh, uh, films on my Blu-ray show, right? Mm-hmm. Feet away. 
Yeah. <laughs> hey, well, anyway, thanks for joining us and, and taking the time to talk about this. Okay. Yes, we, re we really appreciate it. It's been an interesting hour. Again, make sure you reach out to us when you start your uh, independent graphic novel. And we, of course, will be watching closely uh, to see how this plays out in, uh, in court. It'll be yeah. very interesting to see. Me too. <laughs> Oh, right. that, that, that brings me to one last comment. Um, I, cause I've listened to a few lawyers. My father was a lawyer, et cetera. People have lawsuits all the time and the truth doesn't always win the lawsuit. Yeah. Um, I could very well lose this. I mean, you know, they've got a lot of money. I don't, but, yeah. but you losing it doesn't mean that, that you lied or anything like that. It's just the way some things go crappy sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, but, but that's the whole point though, is that they, you know, they walk over people all the time in this manner. And, you know, like I said, when it comes to me, you're not going to walk over to me. That's not going to happen. I'm gonna, right. and, and I'm going to make sure everybody knows I'm fighting you. And, you know, I come from a bad neighborhood. And when the bully shows up, you got to punch him in the nose. That's all. <laughs> yeah. So that's the only way to deal with it, you know. So, and, you know, I don't care if I lose this, this case. Does it? I don't know if that it's, it's going to affect my life in one way or another. But what's not going to happen is that you're going to steal my story and then, you know, just walk away with it and, you know, go take your victory lap. So we're not doing that. So, no. you know, it, 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 at very least, what comes out of this is that these guys will not steal stories anymore because they know the eyes are on them. So they'll be mm -hmm. way more careful about, you know, the material that they're using. So, you know, it, you know I didn't change Hollywood, but I, I fixed a few of them, you know. Mm -hmm. So let's hope then, as a matter of the truth... Should have seen that coming. <laughs>